Cool. Super excited to have this conversation. I'm Chayon. I'm a partner on the investment team at Multicoin. Delighted to be joined by Robinson, uh, co-founder of Wormhole Foundation. And we're just going to chat all things bridging and, and moving things around between chains. So maybe we can just start with a quick intro. Robinson, you want to tell us a little bit about how you got here and the whole story around Wormhole? But yeah, just a quick background. Um, I come from kind of more of the Web2 space, specifically in product BD. I was at a number of different startups. Um, I was actually just telling Shiana, I got involved with mining, with mining Ethereum in 2017 when that was a, when that was a thing. Um, at the time, I was at uh, DoorDash. It was doing quite well, so I didn't kind of make the make the transition. However, once it went public, took it as an opportunity to like, okay, let's let's get into this thing I've been personally interested in for a while. Started out kind of within the Polkadot ecosystem, purely from the thesis of like, you know, they have it figured out from an interoperability perspective, which we were just discussing though, that uh, a lot of things in this space aren't just tech. Uh, we could probably argue over the percentage of like, you know, how much is tech, how much is narrative, both being very important or call it marketing, if you will. Um, so I ended up moving on from, from Polkadot uh, to join Jump at the time and um, focus specifically on Wormhole. And then we spun out the foundation and labs probably just about a year ago now. Um, so yeah, that brings me here. Awesome. So just to kick things off, is there a specific moment in the last couple of years that you can look back on now and say, like, Wormhole is working, like it's doing what it's supposed to? Or is there a sequence of events or, you know, something about the story that's happened in the last few years that makes you feel as though Wormhole is accomplishing its, its, its job? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I'll start with just like a little bit of uh, um, debunking, like I think what people will often do in this in the interoperability space, especially with the term bridge, it's, it's quite loaded. Um, so the way we see Wormhole at the foundation, and I'll probably speak on behalf of Labs as well, is uh, Wormhole is what we would call a messaging layer, right? Some people call it communication, some people call it transport, you know, whatever, it's all, it's all, all the same thing, right? We share state in as secure way, securely as possible, as quickly as possible from one chain to another chain. Um, what that enables, once you have this kind of base layer of connectivity, is to build all these applications uh, on, on top of that. N the mental model is quite similar to maybe like a, a blockchain. Um, so I think just to maybe answer your question, like today, 90%, we have to be honest with ourselves, this may be all of crypto. I know we want it to be more games, we want it to be more social five, but like 90% of what we're doing still is, is asset related, right? And I actually have the belief that like, let's just say that's all we solve for, like think about the broader uh, financial market. Like I still think that's, that's incredibly, like we've accomplished a lot, but I digress. Um, we focus a lot on the asset layer, right? Transferring value back and forth. So I think the the first time, you know, I'll, I'll use an arbitrary number, but when we hit 40 billion in all time transferred between blockchains, I think that was a really big accomplishment. Um, but Wormhole is interesting in the sense that like, it's working really well if you don't know you're using it. Um, so for instance, a couple applications of it that I really like is if you're voting in Uniswap governance, Wormhole is the messaging protocol that secures every Uniswap deployment, right? It has its home chain where governance logic lives on Ethereum. And then you have all these other chains that Uniswap is deployed to. And then Wormhole's what kind of communicates that back and forth, which is, you know, a very big responsibility, right? If you can rug that, you can effectively rug, you know, a lot of the protocol. I think I really like certain applications around like wallet integrations, right? Like making it super easy. I don't think a lot of people understand everything that's happening in the background to go from like one native asset on one chain to another native asset on another one and do it in a decentralized way. A good example is like phantom wallet, um, backpack wallet, for instance, you can just swap from native token to native token. That in the background is powered by wormhole. So I oftentimes say like, Wormhole's doing a good job when you don't know you're using it. Um, maybe if I if I can just give give one more um, is is Pith the Oracle network. Um, so Pith is probably one of the better like examples of product market fit. I, th I think of Wormhole as like in the way of a business uses it to scale. Right. If we think about going multi chain, we're here at multi chain day. Um, it's a lot of work. Uh, you have to, especially if you're going across different virtual machines, you write new contracts, you probably have to hire specific engineers that can write those contracts, you have to audit those contracts, you spend time, you spend money. Um, Wormhole helps you scale with effectively out doing as, without doing as much of that, right? So like with Pith, I think at the time, you know very well, I think they had 90% of the TVL on Solana. Um, and when we started working with them, we essentially took what was very, in a very efficient model, this pull based Oracle and extended them to what I think is now 50 plus chains. Um, so I think, I think long winded answer to your question, but I would say, I would summarize it in saying like, 
we did the pith examples really well because that told me it's like this is a service for builders that is very effective in scaling. Um, I think when use cases where wormholes happening in the background and you don't know it and it provides a good UX. Um, and then things like governance, right? Like combining this, like what could be this very fragmented experience and making it, you know, very unified into to kind of one trusted experience. Yeah. Awesome. So I think wormhole sits at a really interesting kind of vantage point in crypto where you have all these L1s going, going after each other and trying to like create asset issuance and create activity and keep things in certain place. But like the moment someone bridges or something is moving from one chain or like moving from one one destination to another, there's like there's like an you know there's some inertia needed for that, right? Like something needs to happen to get people to move over. What do you you know from from all of the activity that you've seen in terms of people doing things um, that require bridges or message pass like messaging layers or or anything that you know means that you go from one chain to another? What are the drivers for that? Like what makes someone like push the button that says? All right, my, my tokens are going to go somewhere else, and I'm going to claim them somewhere else. Like, what what is the driver for that, and 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 what are some compelling examples of that that you've you've seen? Yeah, I think the the honest answer is probably twofold. It's an incentive plus a val plus value, right? Um, we wormhole got its start connecting actually Ethereum and Solana. Um, now we're on 40, 40 plus chains. But if you think about if you think about what most of the time will happen is you'll have today points programs, right? It's like you're going to go to Blast because there's a really good points program. But what you find is like Blast actually has some novel applications, right? It has, you know, Fantasy Top. Maybe you got into that. So then you kind of like become a user and it's sticky. Uh, maybe you could say the same for like a friend tech example. I think when we originally got our start with Solana, um, you, the value prop was that it was just fast and cheap, right? And and I, I know we belabor that point when it comes to Solana, but it's so true. Anyone, and I've heard this so many times, like having worked between the two ecosystems of Ethereum and Solana, like once people just used it, they're like, wow, this is this is awesome. They didn't really care about the, like the CT crypto Twitter yelling of like, especially back then, like centralized versus, versus not as centralized, et cetera. They cared about like a really good user experience and knowing it was, you know, at least on the roadmap to expand the validator set. So my, my answer would be like, you have to have, like, there's gotta be an incentive first of all, like it's still, still a lot of us are like mercenary users and we have to be, or at least retail is still pretty mercenary. We have to be honest with that, but you have to provide something that's sticky at the end of it. Um, and so the examples like you have friend tech, fantasy top. Um, and I think Solana's value prop was simply that it's fast and cheap. And so um, th that's really what we see. But I think if you have the incentives without the like value, you'll just see it be mercenary. And the once you're done with incentives, it'll go away. Yeah, I, I think I remember one of the one of the Trump meme coins. I think Maga. There's like a Maga wormhole which is on Solana, and I've seen moments where that one is more liquid than the original the original one. So it kind of like there's there's different impetus, there's different drivers for like moving things over. It's it's actually funny you say that. Like talk with our marketing team all the time. The amount of I think wormhole we never we would never say this, but. The bridge is built on top of wormhole is definitely the meme coin bridge. It like the amount of meme coins, because you can use so portal is one of the more popular bridges on top of wormhole, and you can use it permissionlessly. And I, I see if you just go on any sort of scan, like there are so many meme coins that wormhole supports. Yeah. Meme coin market fit has definitely been achieved. Um so I guess to that point, right? Like a lot of people think of L1s as asset ledgers, like the core job of these machines, these state machines, is to keep track of who has what tokens and move them around and sort of program them in certain ways. Obviously, bridging is like one of the core uses of that and asset transfer as a byproduct of a messaging layer. Um, that's something that clearly has fit. There's obviously also other things you can do with a message passing protocol that's generalizable. I think you gave the governance example a little bit earlier. I know there's some big wins there. How do you think about the set of opportunities for something like a like a like a generalized message passing layer outside of just moving assets? Are we still early days there? What do you see the design space that as? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I oftentimes say that there is what's happening right now at the messaging layers. There's what I would call like a modularization of it, right? There's a bunch of core components to sending anything cross chain. And those components are like, can be swapped in and out. Not to use a buzzword, but it's it's simply true. And 
you know, wormholes working on that, but I can chat with you after. Um, but, and then, then you kind of have like the asset and I'll oftentimes say like application layer. And what I would call, what I would say there is there's an optimization. So touching on asset, then moving away from it to answer your question, like to give you an example, you know, wormhole is probably the leader in like the wrapped assets push, right? We, we saw a problem for users three years ago and we solved it, right? You wanted to get your assets over here to this chain. You can do that. Um, now we're starting to see like smarter ways to, to move value cross chains. Uh, I think intense is a great example, right? Like you can front the finality of a slower chain. Uh, you have someone that comes along, takes the risk for a fee, and then we'll fill that on the other side. So you have this like really interesting evolution happening at the asset layer. And there's a number of other things. Um, but yeah, I think just to touch on the, on messaging layer a little bit more, we view wormholes like our number one job, first of all, is to provide this like base layer, but also these tools on top of it. So um, I think about it sometimes like an API, if you will, right? You have like, you're you're pushing a, a message, you're pushing data. Some, you can now pull data, which is pretty novel. Um, not, not I don't think there's any other protocols that focus specifically on this. Why that's important or an example you could use is like, you can compose applications across a number of chains and not really have to let the user know, right? So for instance, and I give, I'll give this like really stupid example. Let's say I'm on a, a game, I'm playing a game on Solana. In order to like for my little character to walk into the door, you have to have X, Y, and Z NFT. You could effectively like write a program where on Ethereum you need to have, let's say you need to have CryptoPunk. You lock that CryptoPunk in some sort of contract and you use a query just to read the state that indeed that is locked and then pull it back and let that, you know, character enter the the room. Right. So I think what the way we see it is we are almost like this coordination mechanism to provide this chain agnostic. And I don't like using the abstract chain mm -hmm. abstraction buzzword, but like you, I think a lot from the user's perspective. So how do we coordinate, whether it's pushing information, pulling information and coordinate this experience, not unlike, and this is a bold analogy, but not unlike a checkout page, right? Like if you're going to a checkout page, there's actually so much that's happening to coordinate the experience that you're using. You know, Stripe alone will have like a payments SDK. They'll give you a checkout module or reference implementation you can use. And so like we think a lot about our role in that sense, at least outside of asset transfer. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think these are, we're still in our infancy of like trying to figure out what these state machines can do. And as the surface area for complexity for that state machine evolves, and there are more of them, by definition, wormhole and, and general message passing layers are going to kind of become more intricately involved there in, in a bunch of different ways. Um, well, I guess given that, you know, in, in your role as a message passing layer, you're dealing with a bunch of different stakeholders. You have the L1s themselves, you have wallets, you have exchanges, you have basically a standards problem kind of to solve across all of these, you know, different distinct stakeholders to create a smooth UX for the end user that's trying to complete a specific action. Um, you've obviously had a bunch of success in creating that standard across a bunch of different chains, a bunch of different assets. Could you tell me a little bit about like what, what, what solving that standards problem has looked like for you and how do you see that changing over the next few years? I could probably talk about this for way longer than we have, but I'm sure if I pulled the room on like who has run into an issue where they had a different flavor of USDC, like the majority of people would raise their hands. Um, I, I have also seen the screenshots. It could be from a native native bridge on Ethereum. It could be from uh, a wormhole. It could be from an Axelar. Like everyone has experienced this like problem of liquidity fragmentation. Um, and the standards, I would call it like the standards let's say problem or issue is definitely a real thing. Um, you know, like I said, worm, wormhole three years ago kind of started, I, I like to think we solved the problem for the user, right? Like you wanted to bring a value from one chain to another. And there were definitely like second, third order consequences to that, right? Like you, again, you get, I remember when we launched SUI, for instance, like USDC has many native chains. So you're going to get, we have to tie it one-to-one -one with where the, the asset comes from. So you get many flavors of, of USDC. This is very much so like a problem that's been fixed and, and been worked on, but this was not, this isn't wormhole specific, right? This is just like how, how this works. Um, so now this like world we've moved to, and over the past three years, we've listened a lot. It's like, how do you solve liquidity fragmentation? I think is what a lot of people. And now I think there's this race to standardize uh, asset transfers. Um, and we see it with a number of different players. We see uh, XCRC20, we see NTT, which is what Wormhole uses, we see OFT. And the, I think the general idea behind this is like, 
people want to move assets or developers want to move assets. They want to go native to native. So from one chain to another, they want to do it as fast as possible. They want to do it as securely as possible, right? And so that happens in two parts. One part is this optimization of the asset layer, right? So like we talked a little bit about in intents, right? If I want to go from native soul on Solana to native ETH on Ethereum, there's now a way in which you can do that and you can do it fast. But technically, actually, if you flip it around because the finality of Ethereum, technically it's quite hard. But the other one is, is standards, right? If a new protocol launches, a new stablecoin launches, how do you maintain this kind of like fungible asset across these all these chains and make sure that, you know, you're not creating 10 versions along the way across all these different bridges. And so like, I'll, I will shill wormhole just for a second, but just so you get an understanding of like what I think the solution is for the broader market. So we ended up take going from like a, we want to like own the standard, like it has to be wormhole messaging to what we call, I guess you could say like a vendor agnostic solution. So native token transfers is effectively you know, you have your uh, contracts on either side that can be burned in mint. It's not owned by the protocol. It's owned by the developer. So they deploy the contracts. They own, you know, whether it's upgradable, whether they want to make it immutable. And they can actually swap in whatever messaging. So when I say messaging, it's like you burn on one side and you mint on the other. They don't have to use wormhole to necessarily verify that. And I think that's where a lot of protocols get worried, right? Because if you have to use wormhole, you're putting a ton of trust into a provider to be here, you know, a decade from here or tw 20 years from now, et cetera. And it's just, it's a lot to, to it's it's a lot to put into to a vendor like that. And so we we did a lot of like feedback sessions, et cetera, to kind of come to the conclusion that it's actually better if we take a back seat and we let, you know, for instance, you could use Wormhole and Axelar. You could swap out Wormhole, just use Axelar. But the idea is that it's vendor agnostic. And ultimately, if you can, if we can start getting behind a standard, you'll start to experience this problem, this USDC problem and things like that a lot more or a lot less, excuse me, a lot less. Um, and th that's the thing, though, that's still interesting is now what you're seeing is like we have figured out the model that works the best for builders. Now, now all the big players have figured it out, but there's an economic incentive to make sure that you have the standard. And so we'll see in terms of what happens, but there's still a little bit of fragmentation in this race to create a standard. Fantastic. Uh, I know we're a little bit over time. I think we could do this for another half an hour. Unfortunately, we can because we have another panel here in 10 minutes. Yeah. But uh, I guess we pause for now. Or? Yeah. 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 Oh, amazing.